physical strength is no substitute for perception. For perception is the key which unlocks the intangible power of the spirit. You perceive nothing. From the heartland in Columbus, Ohio, to the fertile valleys of Portland, Oregon, you are listening to The True Rants Network. Your home for compelling and original content without filter or boundaries. Welcome to our inaugural global transmission. I am your co-host, J.L. Vance, and Riding Shotgun is your fellow host, Roshan Turner. Hey, everybody. And we, first of all, want to thank you for joining us for the inaugural episode. We're really excited to launch this. Uh, It's been a long time coming. We've kicked around the idea in one format or another for a while. And uh, we're finally doing it. And uh, essentially, uh, my take is I don't really want to be a spectator of media or alternative media anymore. I want to be a creator. I think we should be a society of creators and not merely spectators. So... That's what I'm doing. I'm finally taking to the airwaves instead of just venting and bitching to myself about what's going on in the world by myself. I'm going to vent and bitch to you, and hopefully you'll listen. So, Roshan, what's your take? Hey, yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, I just think that um, basically um, we need to um, come to the forefront of everything here. And instead of just sitting back and watching everybody else um, and their their, um, versions of of everything, you know, take a proactive approach to it and, and kind of uh, do your own research and get involved and um, and try to help bring uh, the true news uh, to the forefront of uh, society. And uh, I'm here to do that. That's what it's all about. And uh, yeah, we're taking to the airwaves. And, you know, this is not only us finally doing it, but it's intended to be a call to arms as well. Um, if you like this idea, uh, do the same, you know, make your own podcast, um, do a blog, Use uh, your local uh, community and uh, public access media, whatever tools you have. Like, let your voice be heard. There's way, way too few people in a nation of 300 plus million, a planet of seven plus billion, not letting their voice be heard. And we want to take down the gatekeepers who have not a monopoly on the discussion and the truth, but a near monopoly. And we're we're going to crush that one, one new media enterprise at a time. And that's what this is about. Absolutely, I agree. And uh, we're just going to dig right into it, and uh, we've got a a couple things on tap for the inaugural episode, if we can get into all of it. it's The theme is uh, essentially the government, and has it lost credibility with the American public, or is everything that's happening right now in this crazy summer going to blow over? Um, We're going to kick it off with 9-11, and I know it's kind of cliche to do a, a retrospective every year we see it on CNN, but we hope we have a little bit of a different take. And uh, we're going to dig right in. Uh, Roshan, if you want to kick it off, I think we're just going to talk about the classic, like, where were you? And, and uh, you know, because we're part of the millennial so-called generation, which I think is like 18 to 30. Um, not totally sure about not that. Roughly, but, yeah. Yeah, we essentially grew up in uh, the 9-11 era. I was like 14-ish. So, yeah, man, where were you on that day? Well, I can tell you um, it, it was a it was a bizarre day. Uh, uh, went to school, normal day, you know, there and everything. I was actually, um, involved in a, um, in a, um, career center police academy at that time. And I was, uh, I was in that class and uh, I just remember the, uh, the school administrator just busting in to, uh, to our classroom. Uh, I don't know if it's because we were like, uh, you know, law enforcement, uh, cadets or whatever. He just seemed to, to need to tell us first, but he, he just busts in and he, he says, Hey, you know, um, the twin towers are they're they're burning. There there's a plane that wrecked into them, and you know everybody's just like, what what's going on? And and before we even know it, somebody's wheeling in a TV uh, into our classroom, and then that's that's basically what we did for four hours during the class. That's all we did was it was watch um, it unfold. You know, uh, we saw the the second plane crash uh, live. Um, I believe it was on CNN, uh, and. Uh, just started getting phone calls from people and, and, and that are out there and people that know people. Uh, and then that went on for about a week where, you know, you just go to school and we didn't even have class. We would just, they had TVs just everywhere and people would just sit there and watch. And, um, it, it was, it was, un, it was unbelievable, man. Yeah, that's crazy. And that's, that's part of the angle here because it's a little weird to think of now because at the time, I took what was on the news just for granted as as the truth, and now I view it Absolutely. through such a 
yeah, th- through such a critical lens that it's like, wow, we were glued there sitting watching fucking CNN, you know, and here you have like, uh, you know, we both went to public schools and I had kind of a similar experience. And uh I remember, you know, just to, you know, we're, we're all about no boundaries and no filters. And I'll be honest, like as a like 14, 15 year old kid, um, when this went down, I, uh, my initial response was kind of shocked, but then like, and it sickens me to say this now, but like, I was sort of like a little excited. Uh, and, yeah. Well, yeah, there was a, like a, it's like different, you know, it's, it's new, it's exciting, it's eventful. What's going to happen next type of thing. I had that too. Yeah. Yeah. I was almost like, and I remember talking to like another kid who felt kind of the same way. And he was just like, we were excited that something was happening like during our lives because all we had ever read was history about war. We had never really, you know, I guess the first Gulf War happened. I was like a little kid, but you know, I was, it's, it's sick to say now because like I, I try to think of war now as, as what it is, which is like a bitch. And at the time I just, I thought it was exciting that we were going to go to war and it's, ugh, I don't know. I mean, yeah. And I mean, and, and you know, and I guess to say this, uh, you know, we're not not to offend anybody or anything, you know, about what had happened or people who have lost, lost their lives. That's not essentially why we were excited. It was just like you said, the thrill of um, something new, something different, uh, something out of the ordinary. Um, uh, we're going to have to react to this. How are we going to react? What's going to happen here in the future? Am I going to be involved? Um Things like that is kind of the thoughts that went through my head sitting in that classroom watching this stuff, you know. Yeah, and that's and yeah, to qualify it too, I wasn't I wasn't excited about the actual attack, but it was what's gonna happen now. I think initially I thought it was like the Pakistanis or the Palestinians or something and it, it's 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 just, it's a side note, but it was it was weird now looking back to feel kind of excited and I was a fourteen year old kid, so I'm not gonna feel too terrible about it, but it's just it's sort of perverse that what I think growing up in such a militarized society that I viewed it that way. But yeah. anyway, yeah, um, I, I was like, I, I didn't see the second plane go down like you did. I, it, it was post, I think both planes by the time I heard about it, I was okay. like, it, yeah, I was in between classes and somebody just said like, you know, this happened and yeah, it was the same thing. I don't know. Did you get out early that day? Um, uh, you know, I, I can't remember. I just remember, uh, basically after the things were happening, it was just, it was basically people would just leave and come as they go. And, 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 and the, the original traditional school day ended. I mean, if you stayed throughout your time period or not, you know, that was up to you. But I, I kind of seem to remember people just leaving at certain points and, and, you know, going home or wherever they wanted to go. Um, but I do remember also hearing of people um, that knew people. Um, you know, it's, it's it's just crazy to think the small world we live in. I I was in a career center. Um, my high school was was a, a big high school here in the Columbus, Ohio area. But I did go to a smaller career center, which maybe 500 students or something in there. But within those students, there were people that knew people in the area, uh, maybe knew people in the building itself. Um, and just hearing those uh, those uh, rumors and things like that was just like what? Like it just made it so real, you know, surreal to me. But yeah, it's just um, it's weird looking back on now because I I view just the public school experience so differently now and the corporate media so differently, and it's just I think of them as you know public schools. Essentially, that's a euphemism for government schools, and it's just. And I don't really blame the teachers. I mean, what else are you going to do other than sit kids in front of the television? But yeah, it was the same kind of thing, just like watching constant television and, uh, you know, and another like creepy side note to that is like, there's like pharmaceutical companies that put out ads during this and essentially profited off of like, you know, anti-anxiety drugs and oh, what absolutely. have you. Yeah. It's sick. But, uh, uh, anyway, what we're trying to do here is a, a sort of a millennial retrospective of a nine 11 and, um, pretty much we're going to kick it off by examining a little bit, some of the conspiracy theories. And I'll, I'll preface this by saying that, um, the term conspiracy theory itself is engineered to limit the range of ideas that are out there. Um, I don't know if you'd agree with that, but. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's meant to be a derogatory term, um, you know, whether it's JFK or whatever it is. And yeah, there are some conspiracy theories that are crazy, but it's bandied about in order to lead you to tune out or even get angry when you hear somebody who has any alternative ideas on 9-11, and I was propagandized that way. I remember years yeah. ago, uh, I think I heard, like, Rosie O'Donnell or somebody, and, it, uh, and uh, Mark Cuban, I think, who would say stuff about, you know, whether the government was involved, and it just it sickened me. I was like, how dare you, you know, and it's – I don't know right. if you had that initial reaction as well or if you always were skeptical, but 
Well, I don't know. I just I just kind of took, you know, I played it by ear. Actually, you know, during the time um, that uh, these things were going on, I was a fan of Fox News, CNN, you know, a lot of the major networks. And I took what they said for face value. I, I believed, you know, wholeheartedly that they were there for us. Um, um, and what they reported was was factual only. Uh, and I believed it to a T. Now, you know, come to, you know, later on. You know, I changed my, my views of that. But um, initially, you know, I, I was all about what they were saying, and I took it for face value. Yeah, and I think that's what we're kind of examining today. I mean, this, what we're doing here, and what a lot of other people are increasingly doing is sort of the anti-media. I mean, this is like the cleansing period. It's coming out of this, like, lifelong propaganda and finding the facts for yourself and not relying on these corporate gatekeepers who, I mean, it's like five companies that control – what is the truth? They control in the minds of so many people, even now. And Absolutely. yeah, yeah, the cable news ratings are at all time abysmal lows, even Fox News, which is the biggest. And uh, hopefully it, that means a turnaround. Um, but we're 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 going to examine uh, some of these so-called conspiracy theories. And I want to kick it off with uh, something called the Project for the New American Century. And people who are kind of in the conspiracy theory uh, bubble or what have you are well acquainted with this. And it was essentially a document that laid out um, the plan post Bush getting elected in 2000. It was laid out by a bunch of neoconservatives, a plan for world military domination, more or less, um, or at least huge influence. And they essentially said that they would not be able to achieve their ultimate goals without a, quote unquote, catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Yep. And so mere months after this document, is, this policy paper is put out, uh, they got their Pearl Harbor, which is a bit odd. <laughs> um, you know, coincidences, I don't think exist that much in reality. Um, usually if, when you, where you think there's a coincidence, there's a lot of times a cause and effect. Absolutely. So there's that. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this before, but there's like, I think it was like the labor secretary at the time who like, you know, the government is so good about keeping everybody in line. I mean, right. You know, like people say, like, well, if this was a conspiracy, like, why didn't, um, you know, why haven't we heard people? It's like the kind of people that are attracted to government are they toe the line. They stay they stay fucking quiet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, but I think this one dude in the administration, like he essentially uh testified and who knows, maybe this is out of context, but uh he was in Dick Cheney's office and somebody, some dude c- kept coming in and telling him, uh. You know, Mr. President, um, the, the planes are this close. Um, does the stand down order still stand? As in, presumably, the stand down of, of the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And he, he kept saying yes. Hmm. And at one point, Dick Cheney just cut him off and said, like, essentially, you know, don't come in here anymore. Like, unless if the order doesn't change, unless I say it does. So the idea is, and this could be out of context, but the idea is that uh, 9-11 was permitted to occur by the Bush administration, particularly Dick Cheney, who was the operational president at the time. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's funny because um, it's very um, odd to say, uh, I guess, the least that during the initial um, uh, attack, I would say, um, conveniently enough, it seems um, that everybody, let's call them the chain of command, was tied up in uh, in other other, um, I guess, activities. Um, every single one of them. I mean, you know, Donald Trump failed, you know, um, um George Bush, um, they, they all had prearranged things that they were involved in during the initial attack. And, and the initial attack, it was like they just waved it off. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that gets to um, the issue of and I think this is one of those things. A lot of these are things that I think <clears throat> a lot of Americans don't know about. Um, uh, one of those is that there was a drill occurring uh, the day of the September 11th attacks. And you see this a lot when things when things happen. There's often a drill going on when, when governments are involved. And this drill, the creepiest aspect of it, is the Air Force was doing a drill in which it was combating a scenario in which commercial airliners were hijacked on the day that this actually occurred. Yeah, <laughs> how, how convenient. I mean, <laughs> yeah, and of course that does what you're talking about, which ties up the whole NORAD, the whole fucking Air Force, and they were not able to respond in time because they were doing this fake drill for, uh, you know, a, a hypothetical um, <laughs> commercial airline attack Yeah. when the real one went down. 
Well, any ma- any major catastrophe, if you look back, uh, there's initially reports of a drill going on. I mean, look at Area 51. During that, um, um, the whole hype on that, the first they came out and said, oh, well, you know, we were doing drills in the area. You might have, you know, heard, you know, airplanes. What you saw wasn't what you saw. And then they came up with the whole uh, the balloon, uh, weather balloon thing. I mean, you look at UFO sightings that happened in Arizona years uh, ago. Um the initial response, if you called uh, the police department, if you called the, the local um, Air Force uh, down there, their initial uh, claim was, oh, we're doing drills. Uh, we have low flying aircraft. You know, it's not what you you know think it is. I mean, it's, it's something that they always go to immediately after an event occurs uh, that, that is unexplainable. Totally. And I think it's um, – and, of course, Bush and uh, Giuliani were both eventually on the scene, and they, like – took the opportunity to grandstand and act like they're the heroes. And to me, it's sort of like looking back, it's like you guys are the fuckers who let this happen, particularly Bush. Um, you know, Absolutely. What, <laughs> how are you going to take, I don't know, how are you going to take a stand and act like you did something awesome? What did you do? Damage control. Okay. I mean, initially he just sits in the classroom. He's reading a book. He just, he continues to sit there. He, he waves off, <laughs> he waves off the secret service and says, <laughs> we'll deal with it. You know, like, like I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. You see, I'm reading a book here. I mean, it's, it, it's like seriously, <laughs> and of course the uh, the um, Fahrenheit nine eleven documentary hit that pretty hard. Uh, yeah, it did. Um, but unfortunately, that documentary I think was a it, it had some great stuff like the ties between the Sa- House of Saud, the Saudis, and uh, the Bush family and Osama bin Laden as well, which well, is pretty yeah. pretty key. Well, the thing is, you have to take things with a grain of salt. You c- you can't. Not everything is going to be 100 percent accurate, but it's the bit and pieces that uh, you take from things and that you you can mesh together to to actually formulate the truth. You know. Yeah, I just think Michael Moore is sort of like corporate to a degree. Like there's there's areas he's not willing to go to. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to release his documentaries in theaters, you know, nationwide and make the millions that he's made. Right. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, side note, but another creepy uh, aspect I wanted to hit on this, and I'm not saying that Hollywood is, is all in on this conspiracy or or lack thereof, but there was actually a film uh, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger that was set to release around this time that involved a similar scenario with the, the World Trade Center, and they had to, I think they had the entire thing at least in post-production, they had to scrap it, it never appeared, obviously. Oh, wow. Kind of creepy, but... Yeah. Uh, around the same time, I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah, that's but... Cool. um. So just to give a rundown of some of the most popular so-called conspiracy theories, uh, one of the things that happened on 9-11 that uh, a lot of people uh, cling to is Building 7, which um, a lot of conspirators, quote-unquote, regard as uh, the smoking gun, because this is a separate building. Uh, this isn't either of the so-called Twin Towers. This right. is a, yeah, this is a – and the thing about Building 7, too, is like the whole thing collapsed. Uh, it wasn't hit by a plane. And Building 7 is small compared to the Twin Towers, but compared to, like, the tallest skyscraper in lots of other cities, it's fucking huge. Right. No, it is. It's actually it is. It's actually one of the building uh, b- biggest skyscrapers they have in New York. I mean, I don't know what it rates on the scale, but I know it's one of the biggest. Uh, and, and the government's um, response to, to Building 7's collapse is that fires, um, you know, leveled the building. But, you know, what's weird is... Uh, in the history of our of, of of our infrastructure, we've never had a fire level an entire steel skyscraper like that before. So yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, never never before and never since has that occurred. Yeah, never since. It's just it's just that one incident. And you know, they actually um, another weird thing uh, about Building Seven that I come to find is that, um, you know, they had FEMA investigate the collapse. Now, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, they're not an investigatory agency at all. They, they're, they're, an <laughs> to emergency, say the least, right? yeah, they're an emergency response um, agency, but they have no investigatory capacity. They, they're not trained in that. But they had them um, do the initial investigation. Now, it wasn't they weren't allowed to go into the rubble at all, which the rubble is something I'll talk about here in a second too, um, cause it was quite odd how it was placed, but, um, they were only allowed to go to the, um, the site at which the rubble was taken to, um, you know, uh, post removing it from the actual, uh, ground zero. And they were, they were allowed to sift through 
what was there and come up with a uh, a document onto what had you know what pre- preliminary happened at the uh, site. Um, now, did you see here um, the rubble? Now, there's been a lot of people that have worked in demolitions and stuff. They they say that it it, 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 it resembles a, a controlled demolition um, for three reasons. Number one is its location. Uh, the debris, after it had fallen completely, done its thing, it was centered around the vertical axis of the formal bi- former building. It, it didn't touch any other buildings. It was just exclusively in that one spot. It was uh, four stories high. It was a 47-story building. And the debris was four stories high. So that means it fell completely to the ground into a nice, tidy pile. Um, and, and, and it didn't, it didn't expand out past the, uh, the building location. It didn't affect any of the buildings around it. It was just, it's like a demolition. I mean, that's, that's what some, some would say. Yeah. And I think, um, that's probably one of the more popular, uh, ideas. And I think, um, I don't know. For my money, like documentaries, loose change is probably the most accessible um, and kind of not out there. But it's uh, they had testimony from a guy who's now dead, conveniently, who <laughs> actually was like in one of the buildings as it was going down, and it, what he reported uh, had all the hallmark- hallmarks of what he believed was a controlled demolition at the time. Right. Um, yeah. There's se- there's several stories you can find out there of uh, eyewitnesses saying that. I mean, a lot of the firefighters, um, who, which, unfortunately, some are now dead as well, um, were in the basement of, you know, uh, on the buildings, and, and they have reported similar things of explosions and, and, and stuff um, at the bottom of the building, and then the building collapsing after that. But, you know, that's, again, that's, you know, that's hearsay. Um, that can't be confirmed nor denied at this point. Yeah, and... uh and of course, that's a separate issue too. The the government and all its benevolence in the in the aftermath of nine eleven has um, enough funds to wage war in multiple countries, but not take care of the first responders that it trumped up as heroes. Of right. course, right. Um, and this has been this has been covered by like the Daily Show, but uh, doesn't get a whole lot of play in the corporate media. Um, you know, nobody's following up on any of these people's stories. You know, it's always let's use nine eleven to sell whatever war or you know. Uh, national security state measure we want to impose, but um, you know I haven't I've seen so little follow up on the the widows or the families or the first responders whose actions were legitimately heroic, unlike Bush and Giuliani and these yeah. silk tie assholes. So <laughs> right, right. I mean, just well, that's you know that's corporate media though. I mean, that's you know, yep. Well, and of course, like we said, Building Seven, uh, you know, that's an example of. Yeah, the building went down. Skyscrapers have never gone down before from fires alone, and that one wasn't even hit. So, but um, and another issue that I wanted to hit on with the with the buildings is that if you want to talk about false flags, and for anybody that's not familiar with this term, false flag is a term where a government carries out essentially an attack on itself. Which to the layman, to the uninitiated, this sounds insane, right? And I've thought the same thing myself, but. The classic example in history is, of course, the Reichstag fire uh, in Nazi Germany, in which they Nazis had a pawn, a patsy, burned down their parliament building, more or less, and uh, blamed it on insurrectionists, communists, and what have you, in order to sell the people on whatever they wanted to do. And this is a classic tactic of government, but uh, in public schools, there are readings of history don't cover these kind of things, because in public schools, you're indoctrinated to love governments, so... <laughs> What happened on this day is that – and I think a lot of people don't think about this. They think of the World Trade Center as a, a symbol of our economic progress, our business centers. But uh, it had a lot of government uh, and intelligence housing as well in these buildings. Yeah, actually, I was, I was going to hit upon that. Um, building 7 – let's talk about who they had in Building 7. Now, number one, they were that building was evacuated way, way, way before – um, you know, hours before the collapse, anything like that. Um, but uh, let's talk about the IRS Regional Council was in there. Um, U.S. Secret Service had 85,343 square feet of space in there on floors 9 and 10. He had the CIA. Um, of course, they don't give the uh, actual square footage or floors up there, but they're confirmed to be in there. <laughs> you also had the Securities and Exchange Commission. Wow. They had all of floors 11, 12, and 13. Now, the biggest one, uh, you know, would be 
actually Rudy Giuliani had his mayor's office of emergency management on the 23rd floor, 45,815 square feet of space. Now, years before, after the 93 bombing, they had retrofitted this office with five, uh, 500, hold on, I'm sorry, $15 million worth of renovations. That included uh, a water and air supply that was separate from any other part of the building, bulletproof and bomb-resistant windows that could withstand up to 200-mile-per-hour winds. And um, conveniently, during this time, during this day, this is before it was evacuated, they had already set up a, uh, a remote office in another location that was uh, was miles away from from the scene. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think to play devil's advocate, I think part of that is that they regarded it as as a target. You know, I that mean, could it could be true, but nonetheless, yeah, it's. I think that tends to get glossed over, if not mentioned at all, the degree to which government was housed in these places. This wasn't just about business. You know, right. I think the narrative is the terrorists like targeted the World Trade Center because it was a symbol of how robust we are economically, but there was a lot more going on there. Yeah, I mean, there was other other agencies. Uh, the biggest one in there was the Smith Barney um, uh, Institute had over a million square feet. Uh, they had the ground floor, a bunch of other floors. Basically, it was government or financial, and that's, right. that's what was in there. And that does tie in with another aspect I wanted to hit on, which is that um, coincidentally, or like I said before, not so coincidentally enough, um, uh, in the wake of 9-11, there were a lot of stock bets and options that – were so oddly convenient that it was almost as if there was insider information regarding the terrorist attacks um, yeah. at play there. Yes. And like you said, and like you said, the SEC essentially was housed there. So yeah, um, yeah, weird. And uh, I should probably preface this. I uh, probably should have said this at the beginning, but I'm not in the tank necessarily for any one conspiracy theory. I'm not. I'm putting this information out there because essentially my view is. Um, what I would put out is my thesis for 9-11, basically, is uh, my thesis statement is that I simply don't believe the government's official story. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I don't – I'm not privy to information on what exactly occurred. I'm not quite so arrogant that I would purport to, you know, know what occurred on 9-11. I just know that I don't believe a bunch of liars. So, I mean, and, you know, the – there was the whole 9-11 commission, and they put this book out and sold a bunch of them, and it's like Bush and, Bush and Cheney, um, the two heads of the country, <laughs> give their testimony to the 9-11 commission behind closed doors. Now, what right. what conceivably would they need to hide? I mean, the, the, you know, Bush didn't even know it was going to happen, supposedly. So what right. is what are they hiding? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can go on for, for days and days about this stuff, but, you know, the, the, I want to stress that that's kind of my – my take on it too is I, I'm not uh, I'm not for for any one theory. I'm just you know putting out the information. Um, but obviously something else was uh, afoot here. Um, the 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 stories that was given from the government is is simply just not true. And the way that they go went about giving their story, you know, that's shady in itself. So <laughs> yeah, and um. And I wanted to hit on too because I actually attended at one point a uh, a screening of a film from uh, I think it was Architects for 9/11 Truth, and they essentially went with the controlled demolition hypothesis. But they also pointed out uh, the degree to which the aftermath and the debris was indicative of um, some kind of explosion, controlled explosion. Because um, and here's the weird thing: I think this is a the the juxtaposition of these two things is really odd. On the one hand, uh. Law enforcement or the feds or whoever were able to uncover completely intact or mostly intact the passports and such of <laughs> all 19 Saudi attackers. And yet there were entire human marine, uh, remains. And this is, uh, you know, gross to talk about, but they were essentially vaporized. I mean, there was dust made up of people like bone right. fragments. I mean, the kind of thing that is indicative of a massive explosion that would be capable of that. Right. So just more questions, and, you know, I don't have the answers, but I think it's important to revisit 9-11 from a little bit of a different perspective than, oh, we're mourning, this happened, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to ask any questions about what's happened since then, you know, as part of that retrospective. I never really see that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it'd be nice to see, you know, what what has happened to to, the, to some of the families. Let's have some stories on on what they've done um, since then, what has become of them, um, the, the, the responders. Um, even even government officials that were involved in this, what what's gone on? You know what? 
in your in your lives and your administrations and uh what have you done differently you don't you don't hear a lot um really about that um you do about the security aspects of things we all know that we can't you know we can't walk down the street now without somebody having some kind of facial recognition program that, and and knows where we were when we were you know all this other stuff you know that's been going on the airports um the uh problem with the TSA we've been having with their increased security measures and everything else you know we all know about that but but you know when it comes down to like the humanistic part of it like what has happened to the firefighter are they still working there you know let's do a story on that or you know what I mean? I it just it's just engineered. It seems to just to be engineered towards um, what we have done to make us more safe. But at least to me, uh, <laughs> am I willing to give up? You know all these rights. You know to you know whatever. It, that's a different topic. But well, and it's not even really a different topic because it cuts into what I wanted to hit on, which is um, it really gets to the issue of. What I wanted to ask, which is, um, does it really matter? Does the truth about 9-11 really, in a pragmatic way, does it matter? Um, whether the United States government, and I should preface this too by saying that, like, in talking about so-called conspiracy theories, I think it's safe to debunk certain ones that I, I almost feel are put out there, um, in order to discredit the, the more legitimate ones, such as, um, there wasn't a plane, you know, it was some, <laughs> some like alien, alien creation or some like, doomsday plane or some like um missile missile yeah that's a big one you know yeah and unless we're doing and i understand that and i wanted to hit on the pentagon as well and i get that the footage of the pentagon is dubious at best and that could have been a missile i'm not discrediting that there weren't civilians there i mean there were those are all government people they can toe the line but in the middle of of new york city i mean i'm going to believe the testimony from all of those witnesses who saw a plane i don't think there was any mass hypnosis or anything but <laughs> but yeah i wanted to hit on uh you know, does it really matter? And I think that the other thing you can debunk is, I, generally speaking, I swing more towards the uh, the United States government allowed 9-11 to happen rather than they engineered it. I okay. yep. fully, fully believe that there are legitimate terrorists because I know the United States is hated in a lot of parts of the world, particularly the Middle East, and there are legitimate terrorists. So why send your own government goons when you can just quietly let terrorists slip in? And they did. They trained at, at – uh, yeah. American flight schools. Yep, the, yep. the government knew about this. Yeah, there are did. documents. I, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll put a, I'll, I'll put out a plug right now for uh, the book Sixty Three Documents that uh, the government doesn't want you to read from Jesse Ventura. It came out a few years ago, and uh, it's great stuff, and it's accessible. You can read it in a day, and it covers a lot of this stuff that we're hitting, including uh, more historical stuff. But it's just, it's crazy the degree to which it's just once you go down the rabbit hole, it's. <laughs> all of these <laughs> take the red pill we were talking about this earlier take the red pill <laughs> all of these things cannot be coincidence i mean connect the dots here something something is afoot and the fact that the government needs there always needs to be a bad guy and there's always 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 going to be another bad guy for the government to say that it can vanquish this right. will always be the case they need that yeah. otherwise you don't need them right right and that's that's the whole point and i mean yeah I don't know. I was going to go into some other stuff, but I don't know. It's a whole different show. But um, yeah. does it does it does it matter? I mean, you know, would it, would the outcome be any differently? Would we have you know gone to war with Iraq? Would we have you know spent billions of dollars uh, on security? On uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah, and that's the thing to me. I don't personally think it would be very different, and that's why. And I'm tackling this from the angle of um, activism because there's a lot of people who are so intimately and passionately involved in the so-called 9-11 truth movement. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at what they're doing and the time that they spend on it tackling this. And, yes, it is important. If the United States government was involved or even knew and committed that kind of negligence, my God, it's one of the all-time crimes in the history of our country. Of course it's important. But does it pragmatically affect the trajectory of things since 9-11? You know, whether it was actually terrorists or the government allowing terrorists or the government itself, I think we would still have the wars, as you said. Mm -hmm. Oh, we yeah, would we, will, we would. We would still have the national security state. Um, and it's more than just spending money, to my mind. It's uh, because I think you have to put quotes around the word security in this point, because all of this, like you said, with the TSA, my God, this is about so much more. Uh, you know, Adam Kokesh, who has a podcast, um, he put out YouTube videos where he went around in airports and asked TSA workers how many um, 
terrorist has the TSA caught since September 11th? <laughs> <laughs> the answer being zero. Not no. all of them admitted it, but yeah, I mean, it's, and that's just one example. I mean, it's insane. We're going to get into, you know, the spying, but anyway, what I'm trying to get into is, is this the best use of these people's time, the 9-11 truthers? Or could they be attacking the stuff that would be happening regardless? Yeah, it's wars. a bigger picture. It's so much of yeah. a bigger picture. And, and, and to concentrate on such something, and this is going to sound bad when I say minimal, um, because, you know, 9-11, you know, it wasn't minimal for the people involved and for our country and, and for the world. But in the aspect that I'm talking about it, it is. I mean, there's so much more, such a greater picture at hand here that they could be focusing their time on, you know, it's it's hard to describe, but, you know, like, I'm trying to think of an analogy here, but, you know, you know, it, I don't know, focusing on the small thing in, in the picture is not going to solve the the big crime or the big picture. You know, you, you got to look more broader than that. Well, I guess, like, if I had to come up with an analogy, it would almost be like focusing on um, why you got a certain disease or the origins of that. Which is important, like if it's a lifestyle thing, you need to change that, but rather than f- focusing on what's happening to you, like the symptoms of the disease, and I think the symptoms of this are the wars and the national security state, Right. and these activists could be spending their time uh, fighting this stuff, and, and they, they also wouldn't have their you know their names uh, dragged through the mud as conspiracy theorists, because this is legitimate, and people know it's a reality. The TSA, right. the wars, everything that's springing up, and is premised on 9-11, and like I'm saying, like I, that's the reason I wanted to tackle this, is... You know, and if 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 you were in the truth movement and you received this transmission, reach out to us. Um, you know, and and uh, absolutely, we'll have we'll, ha- we'll have you on the podcast. You know, absolutely. And uh, right now we're working with a Gmail account. Um, but we want to get a legitimate account up soon. It's a rogue agent six one four at gmail dot com. Get in touch with us, and uh, that name is chosen purposely to uh. Bring in the NSA if they want to. <laughs> Welcome, listen maybe, in. Maybe they want to be part of the show, but yeah, you know we have nothing to hide. Um, feel free to call in too, you know, and, and, and we'll put you on the show. <laughs> but anyway, I, and I don't want to disparage people in the Night Lemon Truth movement because I think their cause is quite legitimate. I just, you know, I I feel sad that they're concentrating on just who did it and not like all of these things that would be occurring regardless. Right. And, and something in the past at this point, you know, like if there was like, if there was a, a unit uh, of these people during the time of uh, when, when this was being investigated, that's one thing, but to continue, they're, they're still around today. And it's like, um, let's move on to the more current issues that might've regarded, you know, uh, that might have uh, stemmed out of this, you know, but um, yeah. And I guess the last thing, that I wanted to hit on directly regarding 9-11 is, um, I guess I'll just throw this question your way because it interests me. I think there's, we're finally getting young people who, you know, they're, even some of them are on the, 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 uh, precipice of adulthood and they, they don't remember 9-11. They don't have that guttural kind of, uh, propaganda that we live through. And, um, I don't know. What would you say to like young people and children who, hopefully can approach this with a fresh perspective. And of course, I'm sure there's already so-called history books in the public schools that like lay this out propaganda wise anyway, but oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, what would you say to them about it? As, uh, you know, since they haven't grown up under that propaganda cloud that we did. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really tough to say, um, what their perspective would be on it. Um, you know, I, I I would like to think that they maybe even have a better perspective uh, than than us who have were involved in it uh, and lived it. Um, you know, being with all the media that's out there now, you know, maybe they were able to to read and come up with 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 something that's, that's more understandable than what we have. Um, but I would I would guess I would tell them um, if they asked me, you know, like, hey, you know, you were around, what happened? Like, um. I would just say it was it was just another you know it was it was a, a, a horrific event that happened uh, during our lifetime in which we lost uh, thou, you know thousands of innocent um, people um, that caused uh, some reactions which any big big event like this would cause um, and uh, you know just hope hope that you can learn from what has happened. Learn from learn from even the the um, conspiracies, whether you believe them or not. Learn from the uh, the, the what the government 
you know, their wish-washy uh, explanations for things and just and just kind of understand that um, not everything you see, read, hear is, is always what it is and that um, whether it be for better or for worse. I mean, honestly, the government sometimes hides stuff from the public for good. It's not always like a doom or gloom thing. You know, sometimes it's they just maybe it's not in our best interest that we know something. But, you know, in this case, I guess I would just say, you know, like like our whole premise of the show is just to do your own research, you know, and, and, and find out what you want to believe on your own. Don't, don't let one source, whether it be the president or whether, you know, whoever it may be, just to dictate what you believe, you know, take it upon yourself to come to your own conclusions about stuff based on your feelings, based on your knowledge of things, um, based on, uh, you know, everything around you, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, I would I would second all of that. The only thing that I would um, qualify is is um, government secrecy to me. And I understand what I would say is I think sometimes the secrecy is well intentioned, but I still cannot justify it in my mind. I think when you have all of this mythology that we grow up with about government for and by the people, I can't I cannot personally um, morally justify any degree of secrecy when you have a government that is supposed to be for and by the people. Right, um, yeah. it should be transparent. I mean, yeah, I can see that. I agree with that, definitely. Right, but what it comes to, what I'm trying to say is, it comes to a point where now I'm not saying this. This is kind of off topic from 9/11, but w- sometimes you can't always exactly come out and say stuff because you know security matters. You know. Yeah, well, I mean, there's always situations where there's imminent danger, and I get that. But often, if it wasn't for the government and their wars and their bullshit, their imminent danger wouldn't exist anyway. So true, it's, true. No, but this this gets into um this gets into Syria, which um you know and and to tie in 9/11 and Syria, um it's pretty simple. Um, the Bush administration wanted to go into Iraq. They wanted it from day one. Um, they drew up the war papers. Immediately after September 11th, there's testimony from uh, General General Casey, um, or sorry, General Wesley Clark, who Wesley. ran for president at one point, um, essentially saying, and he was privy to this stuff, that uh, they were going to war with Iraq right after 9-11, and nobody really knew why, because there was no operational ties to 9-11. They were always intending to make it up later. <laughs> um, and now I just, you know, and going back to, like, where were you in the public school experience, we had, like, this whole creepy rally with like prayers and flags on the eve of the Iraq war. It was disgusting to look back on it. You know, I don't blame um, the individual teachers, but the entire institution of public education is diseased and it was, it was, it was creepy, but I'm creeped out now, especially to keep on with the creepiness theme of the degree to which Syria, uh, you know, 10 plus years later and this whole rollout is a carbon copy of what happened with Iraq. And I especially want people to realize that, you know, everybody called Bush this horrible warmonger, and now Obama is, is once again playing from his script here. I mean, this is... And he's got John Kerry out there being the, the main puppet selling the war. And John Kerry is a guy that I think liberals hoped would end the war in Iraq. That's It's clear he never would have done that. He's now right. the the prime war cheerleader. Right. Now, I, I, I believe at this point... Um, um, basically, our country is is only being able to sustain itself because of wars. Now, I, I mean, if, if if you look in the history, wars, you know, bring money into the country. They, you know, they they boost the economy. I think it's come to a point where we have come to a point where we have to have war every every year, or or, or <laughs> we're just not we're just going to collapse. I mean. And this, like you said, it's a carbon copy. Um, I guess basically, I'm just trying to get the gist of it. Um, I guess there was reports of uh, that 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 uh, there were some chemical attacks in Damascus, uh, and um, so President Obama um, brought it upon himself to ask uh, the UN to uh, to curb this in some way. Is that? Well, actually, um, and this is like, this is where, well, like I said, it parallels 9-11. Um, supposedly Obama at one point, like a year ago, said that, uh, because this civil war, and that's essentially what it is in Syria right now, it's a full-blown ethnic, uh, religious civil war. With uh, Assad, because, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, it's important to, to, you know, I'm not a history expert, but give a little background on Syria. I mean, this is another country like Iraq that, um, it's essentially an artificially partitioned. I mean, it was, uh, mm-hmm. it was born, it was born out of like Western powers and imperial, you know, colonialism 
uh, decades and decades and decades ago. It's an ancient place, but like the current political boundaries lump all of these people together who, you know, they don't have the, uh, the multicultural values that exist in the United States. They can't, they cannot, uh, you know, this has always been a powder keg waiting to happen. You know, yeah. it's the same, it's the same with Iraq. You can't have all these tensions. Right. And you, you, you get a dictator, often Western backed, not in this case, but who kind of holds things together. And, um, so what's happening now is not just rebels fighting the government. It's like a full blown civil war. And okay. Obama said, if chemical weapons were used by Assad, and, and it's important to preface this too, like Syria has always been on the chopping block for the United States. They were, it was always kind of mentioned with Iran. I mean, going back years and years to the early stages of the Bush administration, they've always been salivating at the opportunity to attack Syria. Um, this, War has been going on a couple of years now. The Obama administration has never done anything. We attacked Libya. We did some things, uh, yeah. backing, backing some of the so-called Arab Spring uprisings in other countries. We've supposedly stayed out of Syria. I doubt that's true. I'm sure we've had some sort of presence there all along, funding wise and, uh, shadow agents on the ground and things <laughs> like that. But, um, but so Obama said that the chemical weapons use would be a red line and this is a popular thing. And, the the thing that's so weird now is like this is exactly what Bush ruled uh, rolled out. They would when they wanted to go to war with Iraq, they couldn't really talk about anything that had to do with nine eleven because there wasn't anything. So they would talk about well, Saddam, uh, you know, chemically attacked his own people. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yep. And it came out recently that the United States knew this a long time ago when they were funding Saddam Hussein. <laughs> they were giving him. It's like you know the classic thing is you know um yeah the United States knows knew about the uh the chemical weapons attacks in Iraq because they have the receipts. Like, you know, we still, <laughs> if we didn't give them the weapons directly, we funded them and allowed them to do it. And it, it, it just came out recently. It was declassified um, a week or two ago that uh, that the United States, the during the Reagan administration, they knew about this and they had regular updates about Saddam's use of chemical weapons. But at the time he was fighting Iran in a war that lasted most of the eighties and the United States backed Saddam in that war. So they had no problem with mm-hmm. uh, chemical weapons then. You know, we're fine with chemical weapons when we want to use them or when our henchmen right. want to use them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the idea that this is a red line, what I'm getting at, is absurd anyway. But now Obama's saying it wasn't really a red line. And the whole thing, essentially, they're they're not really being very successful with the rollout of this war. Like, people aren't <laughs> people aren't buying it, which is really healthy, you know. And um, they're professing that they don't want to take out Assad. Um, and first of all, we should really hit on the fact that, like, this whole um, chemical weapons thing is really dubious anyway, because there's been no evidence to date. I mean, it's almost laughable the degree to which the government is, has to keep retracing its steps and just they. Once you really cut through the BS and see who these people are, it's like nothing surprises you anymore. That's kind of the mode I'm in at, at this point. Like right. nothing really surprises me, and these guys are just laughable. They're just Absolutely. they essentially they essentially knew that there wasn't going to be any evidence because. Maybe there was a chemical attack, maybe there wasn't. If it did occur, who knows if it was uh, Assad or the so-called rebels, who are – most of them are al-Qaeda. Yeah. So we're essentially, we're essentially saying al-Qaeda is the good guy. I mean this is so, like, Twilight Zone weird. And uh, we did the same thing in other countries like Libya too. I mean al-Qaeda is usually – when you hear about these rebels in these countries, and I'm not saying that the dictators are good. There's no good side to this. There's not going to be a good end game either. No. Oh, no. Absolutely not. There, there never is. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, these are countries that they haven't gone through an enlightenment period. I mean, they're fundamentally in the dark ages and we're toying with them and it's just, it's just going to be an endless imperial adventure. And there's no goal in Syria right now. Essentially what Obama and his administration want is the opportunity to just strike Syria, just bomb the shit out of them. And, uh, well, that's what it seems. Yeah. The end, the end game is non-existent. It's just going to be like Iraq right now. Um, yeah, we we went through some troops and everything like that, but it's it's not over, and it and it's it's something that's not going to ever be over at this point. You know, it's like we woke the 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 dragon of of <laughs> uh, of the world, and, and and you know, there's going to be no no stopping to this. I don't know how what you know how to back out of any of this. How this is going to take out? Yeah, it's just um. I mean, I don't even get it. I don't. I wish I could say I knew what their real goal was here because they're pushing hard for it. Um, I know that they ideally they would probably like to have their ground war and just take over Syria and its resources, but they're saying they don't even want to remove Assad from power. They're not going to commit boots on the ground. Um, 
And of course, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but John McCain, who is like the top war cheerleader, and we could, we could spend a whole podcast on John McCain. I mean, this is, this, right. this, this is a, a weird character. Um, a guy who, given his experience, should probably be like the most anti-war senator. And instead is somehow the most pro-war. It's very weird. But, um, he recently, they had a hearing in Congress, uh, regarding the war in Syria, which he's pushing for harder than anybody except maybe Obama. And, um, the dude is playing uh, video poker on his smartphone, and they caught him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can YouTube this, and you can YouTube the news where they call him out on it, and he just, like, chuckles. I mean, it's sick. He's like a psychopath. Yeah. I mean, it's they're talking about the war that he wants. We're talking about killing people, probably men, women, and children, civilians. Right. Civilians are going to die in this. And the dude is playing video poker. I mean, it's like it's another like just another normal day, man. Just, you know, yeah, just just sitting out, you know, on the porch, just chilling. It bores know? him. It bores him. He doesn't want to debate any of this. <laughs> he just wants to send the troops in. But uh, what I really want to get at is, um, yeah, we're coming down on time. We got probably about another five or ten minutes here left in the program. Yeah, tonight. we're going to wrap it up with Syria. And uh, I think in the next episode, we're going to continue the theme by talking about uh, the NSA spying. That has blown up over the past summer. But just to wrap up the Syria issue, um, and this gets to the overall theme, is is, uh, is the government, whether it's the Obama administration or hopefully uh, government in general, are they losing credibility at this point? Because um, Americans aren't having the war in Syria. And, you know, and granted, there's not the – at the time of the Iraq uh, rollout, 9-11 had pretty much just occurred. And they don't have that this time. You know, they had the Boston bombing, which is a whole other issue, but um, – not a whole lot of people died in that, not to not to downgrade it or be insensitive, but people aren't people aren't going to live in fear anymore. It doesn't seem like. Right. Um, I think it's a good thing, man. It's a great thing, and uh, I, if 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 there's anything that I take away from it, it's that the numbers aren't even better. It's like okay, finally, more than half of the country doesn't want to go to a war, but it yeah, should be it should yeah. be the whole country. I know, uh, but we're awakening. It's it's slow though. It's a slow a slow change, man. You know you. You just, I don't know, you, you look at like a, like a drug addict or something, you know, you know, it, who's in rehab or something like that, you know, it, they can get better, but it's, it's, it's a process. It's slow. And I think that's kind of, it's kind of a weird analogy, but I think that's kind of how we are as humans with anything, you know, like after you've been one way for so long, um, you know, to believe something else or to, to start living another lifestyle, it takes a while to, you know, to get out of it. You just, it's, it's a slow process. Well, and it involves propaganda and indoctrination. I mean, a lot of the people who Which slows are, it down, right? Yeah, they're in the United States right now. Um, they grew up in public schools, like I'm saying, and they've been told that the government are heroes always. And, yeah, um, look at us. I mean, the same with us. You know, you know, you know. With me, I think you're the same way. We kind of just took it as face value. We we went with the punches and and what they said, and then we kind of grew up and 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 our our we just formed other opinions, you know. After seeing, you know, things unfold like this, you know. Yeah, and you you likened it to a a, a disease. Um, I would kind of liken it to a religion because I think people have this dogmatic need to believe that their their rulers, which is what I would call them. Some people would call them leaders, but their rulers are benevolent people. And the right. truth is, they're not. The kind of people who are attracted to power are usually clinical sociopaths, maybe psychopaths. Um, <laughs> and the real the real question I want to get to though is. Has the and this ties in with the NSA spying, which we'll get into in the next uh, installment. But have Americans lost? Has the government lost credit um, fundamentally in the eyes of the American people? I would posit that they haven't. I'm not optimistic enough to say that they have. Um, I think I hope that this will continue and they they won't be able to sell any more wars. But um, I just worry about people because I think what Americans are you know we keep hearing America is a war weary nation. And I think um, War America. That's the new. That's the new uh, nickname for us. If you haven't seen it yet. Yeah, but I think um, War America. And I think what and it's been War America for so many years. It's been War America since early in the 20th century, at least. And this right. is just this is the constant paradigm now. And like I said, there's always going to be a new bad guy. But to tie it back in with what I was talking about, I think Americans are tired of the idea of war because Absolutely. most most Americans. Uh, they don't know anything about war. We have a fraction of the American public that shoulders the horrific burden of these endless wars. And most people have no idea what this is about. They're, they, And I was talking to you earlier about um, how past wars like Vietnam 
were uh, broadcast over television and people could see the horror on their television screen. And that's why people took to the streets in a way that they haven't since for any of these conflicts, because people are and this is purposely done. This is right. why they they trump up. Oh, we have an all volunteer military. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they uh, technically, they, technically. Well, I would say not even technically, because another issue is that um, they don't have a draft, of course, anymore. But they instituted stop loss around the time of the Iraq War, which just sure. sends the same the same crippled, emotionally, uh, spiritually over crippled and over people. Again, yeah. yeah, just same soldiers going back, back, back. I mean, I know people that have have been over there four and five times, man. Yeah. Just treating them like cattle, it's disgusting. Right. But um, That pretty much hits it, and I, I guess what I want to posit is I, I'm just not – I'm too pe- pessimistic about this. I, I think a lot of this will blow over because, because, like I said, it's like a religion. People need to believe in this, and until people realize that we don't need rulers, they're always going to seek – they're always going to want to see the best in our rulers. So this will blow over, and it's going to take a more fundamental paradigm shift to wake people up, I think. I agree. And uh, for True Rants Network, uh, this is Roshan Turner, and uh, we'd like to invite you to listen in and subscribe to our podcast and uh, let your voice be heard. Um, as he said earlier in the in the podcast, make your own podcast, do a blog, uh, get out there, um, educate yourself and your fellow citizens, uh, empower yourselves. We are our own army here. Uh, seek out groups and organizations of like minded people. Yeah, I think um, if we want to put about a plug, uh, it's uh, truerants.podbean.com. Uh, that's where you can find us at the moment. Hit us up at rogueagent614 at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, and hopefully in time, anywhere you happen to haunt on the web. If uh, there's a social media network we're not on, reach out to us, let us know, we'll create a page. We want to be full spectrum on this. And, uh, yeah, this is all about you. Uh, you start your own podcast. Like, this is a call to action as much as it is us doing this. Because what I wanted to stress is, like, there's no hidden room where there's a cavalry that's going to come out and, and change things. Um, there's no white knights that are going to drop out of the sky and save you. Like, you have to look in the mirror for your salvation. Not to sound too religious about this, but um, we are it. We are the front lines. This is it. And I know a lot of people are kind of averse to being told the truth because they're like, well, what can I do? I'm not saying you have to do anything. I'm just saying that it's good to know. That's all. If you are receiving this transmission, you, my friends, are the resistance. Good night.